Merkel Media. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. I feel something pulling at my leg, and I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me, and they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reach my hand into this bush, and I touch air, couldn't breathe, and I couldn't move, because I know I'm seeing a monster. Yep. 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 What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Confessionals. We're your guest host. I am the great and powerful Mr. E. And I am J Clone 42 of Cryptids of the Corn Podcast, where we say. Where, where we say where we're scientific and magical thinking combined. So you put me on the spot. I didn't know you. Were, <laughs> I didn't know you were going to do that. We're filling in for Tony this week as he takes yeah. a much needed break with his family for the holidays. We all love Tony. So and we're very thankful that he asked us to do this. This is an amazing thing. Uh, so thank you, Tony. But I I have to read my stuff now. If you have a wild or crazy story you would like to share with the Confessionals podcast, go ahead and shoot Tony an email. His email is contacttheconfessionalspodcast.com. That's contacttheconfessionalpodcast.com. Or go to the website in the Confessionals Podcast and go to the comment section. Any of those will work for Tony. Just try to get a hold of him. And if you do, you may see the Tony Markle crew hunting cryptids in your area. Ooh. Ooh. That was very professional. Yeah, much more than anything on our show. If you guys come over and check us out, don't expect that level. We're professional on the confessionals. We're professional on the confessional. Uh, also, Merkel Media appreciates all the members, like the members people. Yeah. yeah, like Absolutely. Tony loves you guys. Tony loves you guys. You keep, and we you're, love Tony. Yep. Yours, you guys are the ones keeping things going. You're keeping the ball rolling. Keeping the ball rolling. Yes. All right. So for this episode, we're going to do uh, like a deep dive into the atmospheric creatures theory. We're going to call this atmospheric beast and where to find them. Ha, I mm-hmm. get it. Do you? Yeah. Nerd. It's like that nerd movie that I actually enjoyed. I went to the theaters and saw it and I enjoyed it. Oh. The I first like, one. I was very confused. <laughs> well, the last time we were on the confessionals, we kind of glanced over this topic because uh, we talked for already like two and a half hours. Yeah. So this is an opportunity to take some time and really dive into the science. Um. And about these creatures. And once again, I want to say that this is probably less than 5% of UFO sightings. Right. Some people think we mean all UFOs or are organic creatures from the upper atmosphere. No, probably about 5 to 6%. A lot of the tentacled UFOs. Ooh, scary. Ooh. But that's, yeah, that's, I mean, if, in case a lot of you are new or had never heard that episode back in, when we, I forget when that even released on Confessionals with us. Uh, but uh, yeah, we speculate. Well, not even speculate. Science, NASA did a study and found life in our upper atmosphere. All every clade of life that is in we'll get in to there. Non, what? Taking my punchlines. Oh, your punchlines. I write these long scripts. Well, you got to. I got to at least let people know what, like what we're getting into talking about for sure. Before you, before you just swing blindly. Atmospheric monsters. There we go. Atmospheric monsters. We're going to talk about some creatures that are the like. Bigger than a Walmart. 
uh, up in the at- upper atmosphere. Everything from sky snakes Ooh. to cyanophores to Ooh. jellyfish to manta rays. Ooh. But we're going to do the science first. All right. We always try to do that at the beginning and then have fun with the end. Because we are the science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As you can tell, we're big professionals. <laughs> now, so your first lesson will be on the layers of the atmosphere. Oh, please don't do no. No. Don't do your butt tour bus driver voice. So science, especially in schools, kind of teaches us a lot of stuff that's either wrong or only partially true. Like they don't finish the lesson. So most people understand that the higher you go up in the atmosphere, the colder it gets, right? Right, yeah. And that's not fully correct. Right. And it's correct to a point, though. You'd think it would get hotter and hotter because you're getting closer to the sun, right? Well, less atmosphere to hold on to it. <laughs> so we live in the troposphere. On average, it's about 10 miles up. You know, our part of the atmosphere, it's where all weather occurs that deals most, you know, that deals with us. Where planes fly, you know, most all of the stuff that we deal with doesn't leave that. Uh, the troposphere, once again, goes to 10 miles. Right on top of where the troposphere and the stratosphere meet, sitting in the stratosphere is the ozone layer. This big layer of gas that bumps off radiation. Uh, and then the stratosphere starts from 11 miles to 31 miles. And then above that is the mesosphere, which is 32 miles to 85 miles. We're not going to go into the layers above that, like in depth, the thermosphere and the exosphere. But keep in mind, that's where satellites are sitting, are actually in our atmosphere. Yeah, they're not in and space. So, yeah, they're in our atmosphere. But I digress. We're going to talk about the first three mostly today. So as you raise up through the troposphere, it gets colder and colder and colder and colder all the way up until the you meet the stratosphere. And that's about negative 60 degrees Fahrenheit. That's kind of cold. Yeah, it gets very cold. Once you get into the stratosphere and you start going up through the ozone layer, it gets warmer and warmer and warmer all the way up to about 45 degrees Fahrenheit where the stratosphere and the mesosphere meet. That's almost short weather. Yeah. I mean, it's, but there's tons and tons of liquid water up there. And it's that whole like 25 mile thickness section of that part of the atmosphere is very hospitable to life. And then once you start going up to the mesosphere, it starts getting colder again. Mm -hmm. So you have these weird inversions to where it gets colder as you go up through the trope, the one we live in, hit the strat, starts going warmer, warmer till you hit the meso, then starts going colder again. Mm. So in between the, you know, the last probably five to 10 miles of the stratosphere and probably the first 10 to 15 miles of the mesosphere is a very hospitable climate. First little thing we're going to talk about is this area has tons of similarities to the open ocean. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. As above, so below. As above, so below. As above, so below. Yes. Any questions about that so far? I I had a question. Master Jay. I had a question about whatever trance you just went into (laughs) there for a second. So a big part of it is the open ocean environment or the open environment. There's nothing there. Like there's no cover. There's no, so species evolve in very odd ways. You got clouds. That's about, you're only. Not even up there. Oh. Water, big, big Oh yeah, that's down. Water vapor. Yeah, that's down below. Yeah. Like you get an airplane, all the clouds are below you. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm. So this open ocean environment, a lot of animals in the ocean have had a, a hard time developing ways to do this. Uh, one example is a blanket octopus, which lives in the open ocean. The females have these long curtains they drape behind them, and they are famous for taking shapes of various animals. Oh, yeah. From sea turtles to sharks to even people. Yeah, they look like divers at times. Several people have died diving for blanket octopus, thinking they are a person drowning. They're sneaky Sneaky, sneaky blanket octopus. Yeah. Others get very toxic, uh, like the blue sea dragons. You know, they float on the surface of the open ocean. Uh, and they're really brightly colored and they just don't care if they get seen or that something tries to eat them because it's a bad deal for you. <laughs> uh, you know, so what do you think about those two so far? I mean, yeah, good examples to start with. Another one are most fish in the open ocean are silver. Okay. So they reflect light. I guess I never really thought about that, but like, duh. Yes, they are completely reflecting all light and it's like yeah. a little blinding pocket. So when we start talking about these organic UFOs, a lot of these guys follow those same niches, mm-hmm. these same these same adaptive abilities to where a lot of these UFOs are silver. They almost look like metal, but they have on sides that open and tentacles pour out or eyes or even what looks like blood. But I've, I held a barracuda once. You can almost see your reflection in that thing. Yeah. It's so silver. Oh, and knife fish and stuff like that in the ocean. Like you can. Yeah. But then there's stuff like the sargassum fish. 
that mimics plant, like just chunks of plant matter floating in the ocean. They float like plants and stuff like that. So they see food by, they grab it, and then they go back to floating. Uh. So some of these living UFOs we're going to talk about look like clouds. They look like clouds that are a little thicker, but move with intelligence. Mm-hmm. So they're mimicking what's, you know, what's readily available. And this will be the lower atmosphere, guys, that may be even living in this, you know, our, our part of, the, you know, the yeah. troposphere. So, the, you know, so all these environments, all these mimic things to, you know, prevent from getting eaten. What do you think about that? Well, everything, um, no matter what environment you're in, you're going to find your, in, in nature, you're going to find your way to blend in. You're going to find your way to survive. And standing out like a sore thumb isn't always the best thing. So most things blend into their natural habitat. But we'll talk about some of the gigantic jellyfish-like creatures seen. Yeah. And they don't care to be seen because yeah. they are absolutely massive. Well, it would be like a blue whale like a trying blue whale. to hide. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I don't care. What are you going to do? I don't really care at this Eat point. Eat me? Yeah. <laughs> Not Good happening. Luck. Yeah. The other similarity is the extreme pressures. Okay. So it's the opposite of the open ocean or the deep ocean. It's the lack of pressure. Right. The further you go up, the less pressure. Yes. Or the ocean, the further you go down. But it's also an extreme pressure. And as we see that... Like an extreme lack of pressure? Yeah, but it's okay. an extreme file. Right, right. So that's the term for an animal that lives in an extreme environment is an extreme file. Okay. So it, it'd still be an adaptation to deal with extreme pressure, even though it's extreme negative pressure. Right, the other way. You know, so these guys are living, this could be why they get so big. They're probably gas filled. Their cells are probably stretched out. There's actually some membranes in jellyfish that are almost like spider web and their little cell driplets are like way far apart from each other. Whoa. Whoa. So what do you think about that guy? Uh, uh, the, the, the giant massive jellyfish. Yeah. Well, that and blobfish are a famous example. Like when you pull them up to the surface. What is it? Blobfish. Oh yeah, I've seen them before. They pictures. do not look like that at the bottom of the ocean. They don't. No, they look like normal fish. Oh no, yeah, then, when they come up, they look like a sad little but they've, like. Oh. They've adapted to live in such deep depths. You know, that would crush a nuclear submarine. Oh gosh. That. They, when they pull them up, they kind of implode. How are they pulling them? If they're going that, what are they fishing with? Like insane, like two mile deep uh, fishing line? There are some giant trawl nets. Man. Uh, jigging for blobfish. Jigging for blobfish. There you go. So what do you think about that? Uh, I'm Like the extreme files? Extreme temp or extreme pressures. I mean, it's good. Uh, it's, you got to, it's good to paint the picture, you know, the. The st- what the atmosphere is like above us. So mm-hmm. it's, good, it's good to have that information. Uh, also, the next one I got for you is temperatures. So they can be anywhere from as low as negative 40s as high as 35 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. That sounds very, very cold, right? Negative 45? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, yes, but not. it's not really not that bad. Mm. As far as like extreme cold, um, isn't it like that? I mean, we've had here in Ohio, we've had like negative you know, 10, 20 degrees. What's another 20 more degrees? So many life forms on the surface and in the oceans of Earth thrive in these temperature ranges. From the largest schools of krill on the planet to things like bowhead whales. Oh, bowhead whale. Mm -hmm. An endangered species. That's right. But these ranges are quite acceptable to these guys for long term. Bowheads live, the oldest living mammal as far as we know. Hmm. Uh, there's a bowhead whale that has, I believe, a 200-year-old spear on its back. Oh, my gosh. But by the time that it was the spear was put in its back by the date, they were not hunting juvenile like whale calves. They yeah. They were hunting females. So he was fully grown back then? He was at least a juvenile male. Oh, okay. So he's probably 200. I think they're estimating about 275 or something like that. They got to get that They got to get that uh, spear out of his back and carbon think- date the... Well, they the handle. They know, they know how old the spear is. <laughs> they don't know how old he is. Has a manufacturer's date yeah. on it. But so these bowhead whales grow really slow and they live a really long time because they live in these harsh, cold climates. That makes sense. You know, most of their lives. Yeah. And then you have the other stuff like schools of krill. They live in these cold waters because the ocean upswells of nutrients, hmm. which we'll talk about upswells of nutrients later. Are krill just like, I mean, a little guess, shrimp. Yeah. But they just eat everything, I guess. Detritus is what it's called. What is it? Detritus. Detritus. It just means. Little particles of organic matter. Yeah. They can be uh, everything from poop to whatever. Like plankton. Yeah. Or, yeah. Okay, cool. Any questions about those guys? Nope. Keep continuing. <laughs> Lack of hard structures. Right. This is another one I kind of mentioned earlier with the open space. You know, it's kind of this falls in the same niche or the same little thing that these guys, you know, it's a big problem with breeding also. No hard structures. So a lot of these open ocean animals scatter spawn. They just release millions of eggs and sperm at one time. And just pray some of them make it. Right. And it works. 
Uh, some of our, like the open ocean sunfish, I think it lays like 3 billion eggs or something like oh that. Oh my gosh. Because they, you know, they don't, they, most of the time they don't run into each other. Is that that big? Yeah. The largest bony looking? fish. Yeah. But yeah, so fish like tuna travel to the same area every year. So they may swim, they may circumnavigate the globe or their, their ocean they're in, but always go to these same rocky outcrops to breed. So we start talking about some of these gigantic upper atmospheric creatures and they seem to return to very familiar areas year after year. Is that is that a nod to something future in the future of this episode? Yeah. Okay. That they may be going back to breed. Mm -hmm. And then stuff like whale sharks. Uh, they they'll every time they find a, another one, they'll try to reproduce. Uh, there's giant filter feeders that don't see members of their own species very often, but they give live birth to pups, and then their pups pretty much can take off right then and there. Right when they're born. Yeah. Uh -huh. How many UFOs have you heard that another UFO, little UFO pops at the back of them and takes off? Oh, plenty. Oh, well, it may be a birth. <laughs> you think so? Some. I guess it could be. Uh, yeah. It, so that's where we're at so far. They, these very much similarities to the open ocean. Any questions, young man? Yeah, it's, yeah, I got a question about UFOs giving birth. What if it's budding? Yeah, well, there are some that may bud. Like a, like a jellyfish. Don't they do that? Or they split? Or Jellyfish what? reproduction is one of the weirdest in the animal kingdom. Well, there you go. They produce both an egg and a sperm, and it forms a zygote. The zygote swims around like a little fish, and it latches onto a rock on the bottom, and it melts. And then it forms like a little flower. And then it grows another flower inside that flower, and another flower inside that flower, and another flower inside that flower. And then the last flower becomes a jellyfish and it kicks it off. And then the next one underneath it becomes a jellyfish and it kicks it off, so on and so forth. Yeah, jellyfish are probably aliens. And they're very odd. It's not the octopus. Everyone is missing the mark. It's yeah. the jellyfish. Yeah, that that's type of reproduction is both sexual and some asexual stuff. It's very weird. Now, as you mentioned earlier, life has been proven to live in these upper atmospheric parts. Ah, oh, yes. So NASA and many other organizations have recent in the recent years have begun surveying for microscopic and macroscopic life in the troposphere in the lower stratosphere. So like I said, the ozone layer isn't right at the layer, like right at the meat. It's actually sitting a little bit above in the stratosphere. But so there's a little bit of stratosphere we can get to without going through the ozone layer. Until in the last 10 years, many scientists believe the upper atmosphere was barren of most life forms due to the extreme nature of the habitat, but these studies have shown the exact opposite. The earth is full of groups of animals called extremophiles. These animals fill in niches from all around the world that most people think are impossible to fill, from animals living in sulfuric vents at the bottom of the ocean to the colors of yellow springs, the acid vents, mm -hmm. are types of bacteria. Oh, that's where it gets them the color? Yes. Oh, okay. And they just pick what how warm they can stand and they sort themselves out. Oh. So that's why they're all these big lines. Yeah. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, okay. So the studies have been focusing on that will be focused on is David J. Smith and Samantha Day or Samantha M. Waters of the Space Bioscience Research Branch and NASA Ames Research Center. So you can look up all these. You can go to the NASA website, pull up those guys' names, and find all these studies. They're immensely big. We're gonna short roll them for you. Yeah. Uh, so basically, in 2000, uh, they started in like 2014, 17, and 19. The 19 the one is the one we're gonna focus on for this episode. Okay. So in 2019, they sent these things up that are basically macro and micro invertebrate housing units. When I worked as fisheries, uh, we called them hestrodendies for the, uh, there was, you put in the water. So hestrodendies have like food, they're, we call them bug hotels, but they grow a lot of microbes too. So they're tiny little layers with tiny little gaps going up to very big gaps. You put them in the environment, you pull them out and you can tell what, Macro and uh, micro invertebrates are living there. Mm -hmm. Macro means you can see with the eye. Micro means you can't. So when you say macro invertebrate, micro invertebrate. Okay, that's what you mean. That makes sense. That you can see what you can see with the eye, or can you not see it with your eye? Mm -hmm. uh, so they started doing these surveys, and they left the boxes up with balloons right up into the layer where the troposphere meets the stratosphere. They were maybe expecting to find. 14 ish species so just of like, anything, like a small handful. Anything, I mean, yeah. we're talking mostly bacteria and algae, right? They found around 4,000 species of life. Every, like you already ruined, <laughs> every biological clade that doesn't have a spine has been found up there. A representative of each clade. Oh, sorry to ruin it for everyone. Yeah. So, there's my apologies. There is a jellyfish like thing up there, yes, there's fungus up there. Bacteria, plant, algae, all the mix, even some insects 
have been found up there. So yeah, if you just go outside, take a look up in the sky, all this stuff's right above you all the time. So these guys, uh, they think that they ruined the survey because when they were doing the survey, they left them up a little too long because they weren't expecting to find nothing. And what ends up happening is some of the bigger stuff starts eating some of the smaller stuff. Oh, so it could be more. They estimate around 11,000 species. Oh my gosh, that's a lot. Because a couple of the big the big guys are just like, num, 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 you know, yeah. eating everything else. Right, they end up in this hotel. Yeah. They're going to eat all the other guests. So life has already been proven to have extraordinary forms in the upper atmosphere. Right, yeah. Yeah, and that, I mean, that when we first found that out, that was insane. And I remember when you were researching that, uh, it was extremely difficult to find that study. Oh my gosh, yes. Like NASA buried it, buried it, buried it. And I have the link. I will try to remember to send it to Tony and he can give it out. Yeah. But good luck. Yeah, good luck on but that. Type one. in what I said. I'll read their names one more time. David J. Smith and Samantha M. Waters are the main researchers. In Pulp, they have done so much fascinating work mm -hmm. into this field. Uh, but yeah, it's easier once you know their names. And that's actually how I end up finding it is I think I seen David's name associated with something else. Mm. And then I reverse searched his name and found it. Wow. If you type in NASA study life, upper atmosphere, you will get nothing. Yeah. They do not publicize it. They do not. Which makes you wonder why. I mean, well, NASA, never a straight my, answer. That, yeah. I, nobody likes any of this, any government agency. But they're not government. It doesn't matter. They get government funding. I know they they are the government, but they're not. So the government can do. Yeah, you get it. Here's my thing is I think that why they're not pushing it hard is because they don't want everybody to know about it yet because mm -hmm. I think they're going to finish it, finish the study because the study stopped abruptly because COVID bu you know, busted out mm -hmm. right when the last study. The yeah, 19. 2019 was yeah. that study. Yeah. So right. And that was late summer. Oh, so right when they so got their first big one, when stuff and they were was, probably getting ready to go, yeah. everything shut down. Yeah. So I think that to me leads, you know, I I believe in all, all kinds of conspiracies. I think to me, though, personally, that this might point to a couple scientists wanting to save their research until they can pursue it. Did you? I, I understand what you're saying. Absolutely. But did I just witness you saying you believe? In some conspiracies. I thought you said all sorts of conspiracies. Maybe. It's recorded, maybe, so you'll know. Maybe you did. Oh, these are, this is breaking news to me. Just not the ones you believe in. The earth is not flat. I don't think it's flat. Nah, we won't get into it. <laughs> we'll not get into this. All right. My next little segment. Platonic like life. The perspective of biology of the food chain above us. Ooh. So, we've discovered most of these organisms that are living in the upper atmosphere are very, very, very similar to what we would consider platonic or zoophile life in the open ocean environment. Oh, so now I was thinking, when you said that, I was thinking tectonic plates for some reason. No. <laughs> okay, so like plankton and things like that? Yes. Okay. Uh, these animals are not plankton. They're very, very similar, similar to plankton. Like cousins these or something? No, like as in their behaviors and what they oh, do in the gotcha. environment. gotcha. Okay, okay. They're as in, they are... Very, they doing this, they're doing the same job. Filling the same niche, niche as the yeah. ocean ones, but this is up in the atmosphere. So almost always throughout Earth's history in the fossil record, when these platonic life, like animals or things or plants or fungi develop, the whales follow. And I don't mean whales as in traditional, like what we see in our oceans. The big the open. The big filter feeders. Yes, yes. They follow. From the Permian period to the Devonian to the Jurassic, you know, the Cretaceous. You know, the it's Pleistocene, always happened. It happens every it's time. How nature operates. Yes. It's, it is, nature abhors a vacuum. The upper atmosphere is actually a very safe, stable environment. You know, most of these stuff that happens doesn't leave. Like a lot of the volcanic eruptions, mm -hmm. soot and ash still gets up there. Don't get me wrong. Right. It's not like being below though. A big one is the radiation, which we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. So this is this thing we're expecting to see. So when we start talking about the forms of life we're seeing in the upper atmosphere, these suspected UFOs that are actually alive, we think we have found the whales and the sharks and the fish. Because, uh, uh, yeah, I think if we haven't hit a home yet, like we said earlier, as above, so below, mm -hmm. like in kind of a, in a joking way, but it's serious in a serious way, um, we do speculate the, the upper atmosphere does reflect the same like... Uh, I don't know, qualities of the ocean. So here's your whales, quote unquote whales in the sky following your plankton. Yeah, it makes sense. 
So Keebler's Law, we're going to talk about. The Are elf? We? No. Oh, okay. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, he's very powerful. But we're going to talk about why animals get big in these environments, not just the food source. Because mm. there's a lot There's a lot of reasons in Keebler's Law. All right. There are uh, several reasons open space breeds bigger creatures. Firstly, Keebler's Law. Keebler's Law is a biological uh, principle that is a short state that an animal, lar or a larger an animal, the more energy efficient they become. Mm -hmm. This is for several reasons. Travel. It is easier for a large animal to move greater distances than a small animal. Mm -hmm. And you look at this like elephants and giraffes and even the big sauropods of the Jurassic. They move a lot faster. Blue whales today, they swim so fast and they don't look like it because they're so big. They're just so massive, yeah. Also, heat conservation. Mm. You have less surface area to your volume. Ah, uh, okay. So it's easier to stay warm in these cold environments like whales. Right. You know, the bowhead whales can live in these cold, harsh environments forever because they're so big. Mm, okay. They can handle it. That's why most whales leave these environments to give birth. And then they come back into them once the baby puts on enough weight. To handle it, yeah. To handle it. The other one is um, taking advantage of food opportunities. So, it, like krill balloons, they happen. And they're, you know, hundreds of miles long. Mm -hmm. They're not everywhere, though, in the open ocean. It may take you hundreds or thousands of miles to get to the next one. So, to be big, you take advantage of that food source when you find it. Mm -hmm. You can eat everything and put up so many calories and put on so much weight and then wait to the next one. It's, yeah, and you can store it for a while, yeah. So that's why like six-gill sharks and sleeper sharks at the bottom of the ocean, they get bigger than great white sharks. Yeah. Because that's what they need. Whale fall carcasses are so rare and them finding food are so rare in these deep ocean. A deep ocean gigantism is another thing. Uh, but that happens also. Mm -hmm. And that is Brigham's Law is deep ocean gigantism. Ah, okay. Which is some of these same things, conservation of heat, but it's also for food, you know, taking on food, the uh, the bigger you get, the more food you can put on mm -hmm. and also getting to these food sources. So these are two different environments, two different laws of very similar practices. All right. So what do you think about that? Well, it's, it's like you said, it's uh, mirroring the ocean as how it's going so far. The laws, because those are laws, you know, they, are, is that for all environments? No, the, those or two, it, one specifically deals with the open ocean, ocean okay, and that's one deals with the deep ocean. Exactly, yeah. But they can, in my opinion, be applied to places that are similar. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, yeah. If the if the uh, what, habitat is that what should I call it habitat yeah, biome or so what? It is the largest habitat on the planet. Oh, the atmosphere is the upper atmosphere by oh, it has to be a ton. massive yeah. percentages. Even the small area we're talking about, yeah. for this this kind of study mm -hmm. is still you know hundreds of times larger than any other environment on the planet. Well, you got to imagine, you know, there's land and sea, and this is encasing all of that. Yes. So, of course, it would be. And it's, yeah. you know, it's 25 miles to 30 miles thick, what we're talking about. It's, oh, that's thick with two seas. Yeah. And, you know, deepest part of the ocean is like either seven or 11 miles. I can't remember. Oh, I don't know. So, it's Mariana's Trench. Yeah. So, it's it's not, you know, there's a lot. A big thing that maybe we kind of skipped over was the ozone layer, the radiation layer. Mm -hmm. So, they thought life was, uh, you know, couldn't survive above the ozone because of the, the solar radiation coming in. Mm-hmm. Many of the animals that the levels, I'm not going to go in the units of radiation and stuff like that, but many of the animals that live that could that would need to survive the radiation up there, we have animals down here on the surface that can survive those levels of radiation easily. Okay. Like the big misconception with tardigrades is they're invulnerable. They're, you know, they're- they The water for, bears? Yeah. Okay. The problem is there's thousands of species of tardigrade and each species can survive a different extreme thing. Gotcha. But, you know, this one that can survive the acid of, you know, the deep sea sulfur fence- would probably die in space. But there are ones that have survived in space and made it to other planets and stuff like that in our solar system due to hitching a ride. So these extreme files can't, you know, can develop. But there are plenty of animals that live low that can survive these radiation. A lot of them have either fast regeneration or the ability to absorb some radiation. And then you even have things, stuff like fungus on our surface levels that eat radioactive materials and absorb radiation. They love it. Mm. So we can't talk about it greatly, but we have a, a friend that worked with a lot of radioactive materials and they had to paint antifungal paint on everything because the fungus loved the radioactive material so much it was just destroying everything around it. Which is could have been very dangerous. Yes. Yeah. So to say that there's no life up there because the radiation level is very 
as far as life's concerned, mild, is ridiculous. We have stuff that not only survives the radiation down here on the surface. It eats it. It eats it. And yeah. we're talking about, you know, tenfold of what would be up there. I, I, we wouldn't do well. No, absolutely not. But we are also, we don't handle the radiation we have well right now. I was going to say, unless your skin and hair and everything falling off, like your, your bonds that hold your body and cells together, you know, separate. If you can survive that and handle it, then we'd, be, we'd do fine up there. Yeah. So they're living up there eating each other, so, you know, flying around. They have their plankton. They have their algae. Yeah. Also, the early space shuttles that were going into space said that they are going through the atmosphere would hit a green film for just a second. And they'd see it on the windows. Hmm. And then they'd blow past it. And they were probably hitting this barrier because it's probably packed full of algae. <laughs> Just plowing right through it. Yeah. Putting holes in it. Oh, that's not. Oh, okay, I gotcha. The ship is putting holes. Yeah. Um, I do have a question though about uh yeah. things that like funguses that eat radiation. So let's say it eats it. Uh, I don't know, is fungus I don't know how does it how does it dis dispose of its waste. Metabolization of fungus is above my pay grade. Okay, I was going to say, I, was, I just... I dealt with I fish and salamanders. <laughs> but no, I know there are... I was are, about to ask you about mushroom poops, but... So it'd be like, it'd be a different form of metabolizing radiation. Mm. Think of plants. Yeah. Metabolize sunlight. True. Which is a form of radiation. Mm -hmm. And then they poop. They I would, they don't poop. Oh yeah, you're right. They, I don't think fungus poops is yeah. what you're getting at. Mushrooms. I, yeah, I guess not. I guess it's just how does that radiation has to break down and turn it, and then is it not radiation anymore? I think it's just transferring the energy into something else. It's a little bit above my pay grade. Okay. Like photosynthesis, I can tell you the the eighth grade level of what photosynthesis is. <laughs> right, right. I cannot tell you the chemical reactions. I can remember the happening. picture in the book, yeah. But no, but it's breaking it down by chemical reactions and turning it into an edible form of energy. Mm. I was just, why don't they throw that fungus down in like a... Uh, Tunguska or the, uh, where the in Ukraine where that uh, power plant melted down. What's that I know called? some of the uh, lighter nuclear waste disposal like does they do have these funguses. Yeah, they do use some, and there's other forms of life that eat radiation. I mean, we have animals that eat like we talked about iron sulfide. The iron clad snail mm -hmm. eats iron sulfide at the bottom of the ocean. They have they don't have a digestive system. It's all in their throat. And then you have stuff that like some of these crabs on sulfuric vents eat some sulfuric materials mm -hmm. to survive. Okay. So eating a material that's not traditionally edible yeah. is not anything new. Life finds a way. But for that radiation belt, you know, stuff above it. I also think that some of these larger animals may pop below the ozone layer to hang out for a bit. And that's when they can get swept up in storm currents mm -hmm. where they get pulled down to us. Because a lot of, we'll talk about, a lot of these guys are seen around storm events. Mm -hmm. But yeah, any questions about that so far? No, I think it's pretty thorough. Now, the, covert, the covergent evolution is a phenomenon where animals living in similar niches develop and evolve to similar looks, mm -hmm. uh, where these guys can be looking like, so best example, sharks and dolphins, they swim a little differently, but they have almost the same fin pattern relatively, you know, and they have a lot of the same adaptations, the sleek, you know, slender bodies, that kind of stuff. Okay. Questions? Nope. Makes sense. Now, here's a big one we get a lot with talking about organic UFOs is where are they on the radar? Like, oh, you mean Why when they're scanning? Why are we seeing these guys? When yeah, like at the, every airport and stuff, you know, they yeah. should be pinging them, right? So we often do see them as close up on radar, but not long distance radar. Okay. So these creatures are often seen from the ground, from planes and jets. Uh, pilots often, they show up, but they, they don't show up on close, or they show up on close instruments and vehicles, but they don't show up on ground radar. The same radar phenomena was happening with sonar in the ocean. Oh, bum, bum, bum. Large organic beings are low density like whales. Even though whales reach massive sizes, long distance sonar has a lot of trouble picking them up. This is a problem of density. The long distance sonar and radar can't, is designed to pick up high density material and objects like planes, jets, missiles, and submarines mm -hmm. from long distance. But low density organisms would be almost invisible. They may ping for a second and then unping and stuff like that. Just like maybe the angle you hit it at just right. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about close range sonar and radar, it's much easier to time tracking organic animals. Uh, this is why they hunt whales, uh, whale hunting vessels. They use these close range son or sonar to track whales. Mm, okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. Yes, it do. Now, this is one Tony may have yelled at me about uh -oh. you know, that UFO Christmas special we did with Joel a while ago. Yeah. Where I said, this is like what happened with the Tic Tac UFO. Oh, I remember this. Yeah. Yeah. And because I think the Tic Tac UFO may have been one of these organic animals playing with the fighter pilot. Hmm. Because it big was showing take. up. Yeah, big take. It was showing up on close sonar or close radar, 
but not long distance or ground radar. Oh, that's because it was in a, some other dimension. It was bending gravity. Be. But to me, when you watch that video, it looks very much like a dolphin playing with a tugboat where you see him swimming in front, beside, screwing all around. And then once it got bored, it was like, all right, I'm going to leave. Yeah, but that's not what David Grush said, did he? No. I was going to say, he did, right. definitely did not say that. Enough science. We're going to talk about sightings. Finally. This is Finally. the juiciest part. All right, let's talk about today's sponsor. This holiday season, let Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service, take the stress out of mealtime. With chef-prepared, dietitian approved meals, Factor delivers nutritious and delicious breakfasts, lunches, and dinners right to your doorstep. Save time and keep up with your health goals amid the holiday rush. Bid farewell to meal prepping. With Factor, you skip the planning, shopping, chopping, and cleaning. Enjoy fresh, never-frozen meals that are ready in just two minutes. It's all about convenience and taste. But Factor isn't just for dinner. Enhance your day with over 55 add-ons. Choose from quick breakfast items, lunches, snacks, and a variety of cold-pressed juices, shakes, and smoothies. This holiday season, focus on what matters most and let Factor handle your meals. Head to factormeals.com slash confessionals50 and use code confessionals50 to get 50% off. That's code confessionals50 at factormeals.com slash confessionals50 to get 50% off. So let's go over some of the types that we've identified in the organic UFO field. These aren't all of them because we're going to, we're saving some of them back, but these are some of the types. Manta rays, sky squids, siphonophores, Atmospheric jellies and star jelly events. Ooh. So we're going to go through. I got some stories of some sightings, some some fun stuff for you. I included uh, the big one for us. The first one that we ever got sent in to us that kicked off this first one. The Kansas Manta Ray. This happened in central Kansas between the years of 2001 and 2002. The witness that we now know, but he chooses to remain anonymous. The witness encounter comes directly from this man. Uh, I'm just going to read it word for word. Ready? Right. Yep. Back around 01 or 02 time frame, a friend and I were lying on a car hood, ta- talking and looking up at the night sky. We were talking about the stars and personal relationship type stuff. It was a clear night in Kansas and the stars were very visible and the moon had a good amount of light in the sky. As we were talking... We both pause for about 30 seconds as we see something very large flying gracefully above the tree line. It was flying slow, and its wings moved like they were a manta ray. The front of its, whatever it may be, head was slightly longer than the rest of the manta ray's head would be. But it did not disturb the trees that were only 30 feet below it. You could see through it as the same thing like looking through clear gelatin and make out the stars on the other side. I thought maybe I was tired and my mind was imagining it. I feel tears welling up in my eyes due to the awe-inspiring event that happened, but brushed them to the side. I look at my friend sitting there next to me, and she was bawling, and I asked, Did you see that? I asked her if she saw the same thing flying too. I, I tried to be as vague as possible to make sure that she saw the same thing it was. Mind you, this is in Kansas, nowhere near a body of water. Closest river is about 50 miles away. Its size was close to that of an airliner, maybe a little smaller due to the depth perception. Completely silent, and thought its movements were very much creature-like, not something man-made. Mm-hmm. So, these giant manta ray-like creatures, I'll give you kind of the basic description, have two of these giant wing-like structures and a centralized body. Depending on when you see them and who sees them, sometimes people see organs inside. Sometimes they don't. The front of it almost like it doesn't have like the manta ray head, the tendrils that come out, the feeding apparatus. Right. It has almost like a cone head that comes out for direction. They flap really slow. It's clearly evident that they are not flapping for propulsion because they're so how slow they're flapping, they'd be falling out of the sky like rocks. Yeah. Most likely, what's happening is they are gas filled and they are flapping to steer. Mm, okay. Using wind currents and stuff like that. They're very slow, almost gliders, these right. giant gliders. 
This story got sent to us after we did our Ohio River Manta Ray, which we'll cover here in a second. These guys are big. So, you know, airliner Boeing 757, we talked about, you know, 140 feet long. So if it's a little smaller, 120 feet long, it's about the size of a blue whale. It's a big, that's a big creature. Yeah. But this weird phenomenon that happens specifically with the manta ray type is all inspiring. Right. It's like, like seeing whales. A lot of people, first time they see whales up close, they cry. This, this same thing happens with the manta ray phenomena that all over the world, these people that see these things almost seem to cry every time they see them or get really emotional. And most people aren't scared of them. Yeah. It's like being around a whale. You know, the, you see this massive creature and it's swimming or moving so slow and gracefully, but you have no sense of your body of threat. wonder if it is just like a seeing a an big animal, but knowing it's not a predator, knowing it's not a threat. And it's just, that's the awe inspiring part. It's just an overwhelming feeling of seeing something so big. It's just, you realize somewhere in your uh, subconscious, you just... No, nature is beautiful. Yeah, and I think there's a lot, especially with these manta rays and the jellyfish, like that. Where people see them, it's not scary, but they're right. huge. I mean, when we get to the jellyfish ones, we'll tell you some huge encounters they've had. But I do want to go over the Ohio River manta ray, probably the one that got us kicked off on this whole phenomena. Yeah, the Ohio River manta ray was in Mason County, West Virginia, and Ohio. They're right on the border. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ohio River, December third, two thousand three. So in Mason County, West Virginia. All right. You ready for me to read this encounter? Yes. In Mason County, West Virginia, along the Ohio River, a man and a woman witnessed an incredible sight of a living UFO. The couple stated that they were heading home from Huntington, West Virginia, on this night along the river. And they had an unbelievable encounter of a large manta ray-like creature that was, you know, as best as they could tell, was a UFO. This animal was doing giant figure eights over the road in the river. Now, this behavior is very similar and seen in many open ocean filter feeding animals, including manta rays and whales. They watched the creature for some time before it gently flapped its wings and started to head back towards the sky. A day later, a woman and her daughter in Randolph County, a short distance from the first encounter, had seen a similar animal flying over the car. Two interesting facts about these encounters is both parties seen a very similar creature. They all both had no fear, and they both reported their encounter days later. Mm -hmm. So they had these encounters. They reported them almost at the same time. And they did not know each other. Right, exactly. So they seen this really oddly shaped animal, reported it, and didn't know each other. So what I'm getting at is that they both seen the same thing. Right. They had no chance of cooperating this they had no chance of hearing about one encounter and first like, and then, yeah, and then yes. you know so that's an interesting thing yeah that's probably the most famous story too of the uh the man the sky manta rays or the well the high river manta ray that's i mean when we looked it up it's basically like the only one out there mm -hmm. that's documented all right the next one the next type i got for you is the twister worm which is the cyanophore or cyanophore type mm -hmm. Now, the Twister firm is Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, May 3rd, 1999. You can actually find the witness's name. Uh, she did come forward. I'm not going to. I'm just going to use her first name, Danny. Okay. But yeah, like she's one of the few of these weird UFO cryptid encounters that gave her full name. And actually, you could almost find the exact place this happened, the farm. Hmm. So Danny was a resident of an Oklahoma City, uh, and she was an avid storm chaser. But on this evening, she experienced something that she would never have witnessed before. May 3rd, 1999, a tornado touched down with the fastest speed recorded on Earth ever. Danny watched uh, from her porch as a tornado approached it. And it was this time when they started recording. They witnessed during this lightning flash what appeared to be a long piece of corrugated tubing all in, inside the tornado, like swinging around. Mm -hmm. Upon further inspection, it appeared to be a living creature with a long, tro uh, transparent, worm-like body with a head wide like a hammerhead, which we'll come back to. Uh, she speculated that the length of the creature was at least 150 feet long. It appeared to be swimming alongside in the tornado, like in and out, but there were tons of smaller, similar creatures swimming in the tornado with it. Swimming. Yeah. The creature stayed in the storm until it completely was out of eyesight by this witness. This encounter bothered them so much, they never went tornado chasing again. So it's definitely the opposite uh, feeling of the manta ray. Yeah, these are... So this 
there's long corrugated tubings. So we talk about this, maybe gas filled chambers, these long slender bodies, the little ones flying around. I don't think this thing was enjoying the tornado. I think it probably got sucked down from the upper atmosphere. It was it, stuck in it. It was stuck in it. Okay. It probably died. Yeah. It was probably eating the little guys that was chasing him. Like it was, you know, yeah. and then they, they all got caught up in a tornado with the fastest winds ever recorded oh. at that time. Yeah. And it, yeah, it probably died the next county over. Where's the dead bodies? They rot very quickly. Yeah. Cause, well, I think any atmosphere creature would, cause they're not made up of, they're very, uh, Low mass. Let's put it Soft that way. Soft and squishy. So like jellyfish and even stuff like salamanders will dissolve so fast. Like jellyfish, you know, big gelatinous masses. Well, remember that time you had that uh, salamander in your tank? and uh, yeah, I, had, I had an oxalot pass away. And yeah. by the time we got home, it was completely dissolved. It was gone. The tank was empty because the things, I mean, that only been like a few hours. We found it in the morning. And then we went, what'd we do? We left. We went and got lunch. And we're it, like, I'll clean it up, and, you know. Came back like later in the afternoon and the tank, I mean, the, obviously the water was still in there, but it dissolved in the water. The, the, the body of the specimen was gone, completely dissolved. My mind was blown when that happened. I couldn't believe it. I, I, I would have sworn someone went in there and took it out and like, I don't know, disposed of it, threw it away, buried it. I don't know what you do with salamanders, but no, it disappeared. Completely. Yeah. So these twister worms have these 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 uh, cyanophores or cyanophores. They have these giant wide heads. Now I don't think they're heads. I think they're mouth bits. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at stuff like bobbit worms, right, which have these yeah. giant hinge jaws that are like mouse traps. They're pushed under tension, and then they snap shut real fast. And bobbit worms are scary. They're very scary. Yeah. If you haven't seen a bobbit worm, imagine like that. Remember that giant space worm, like in Star Wars. That comes up and tries to hit, eat the ship. Okay, now they're not that big, but they're, uh, it's like them living on the beach and they, like on shallow waters and they snatch, you know, little fish out of the water. They're just, but just like that, then you yank them under the sand and they're like three or four feet long, aren't they? They're probably oh, longer. They get like nine, 10 feet. <laughs> That's insane. But yeah, they got those big jaws. Like you said there, it looks like a, or like they, the Danny said in her account, it looks like a hammerhead shark, but it's, like like you're explaining or you're speculating, you think it's the jaw that's sticking out, yeah. not the actual head with like eyes on it that are sticking out. It's just the jaw. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think they're, I mean, I think they're big. I think these are our sharks. I think these are these animals that are probably active predators just from having a very long streamlined body. Looks like it's probably built for speed. Mm -hmm. And like I said earlier, I think they're coming down out of the upper atmosphere and maybe getting stuck in our storm systems. Yeah. Because yeah, with storms, I mean, you got a lot of swirling, uh, well, just wind. The whole general, atmosphere but, gets torn up, not yeah. just the tornado. Exactly. Like the whole atmosphere is under extreme stuff. So if you get caught in the wrong spot, wrong time, mm -hmm. which, for example, just because an animal's big doesn't mean it can't get stuck in the wrong spot, the wrong time. Yeah. The humpback whale that ended up in the middle of the Amazon. Yeah. Ain't that nuts? Yeah. And it was literally people like it got dropped by a UFO or not. You know, no, it was literally in a storm, in a storm surge. And it was a humpback whale that was in the wrong spot at the wrong time and got stuck in the rainforest. That's insane. I mean, might as well be a UFO. I don't. I think a UFO is less uh, less is, crazy. Yeah, less crazy. Now I got a jellyfish one for you. The uh, Quinzane is that how you say it? Uh, I can't ever. I can't ever read Chinese. Oh gosh, I Quinzane UFO. The uh, I got a jellyfish UFO sighting for you. Okay, yeah, this it's is a pretty China. famous one. It's in China. China. Let's leave it at that. I'm going to try to read names, but good luck. Oh, my gosh. No, so uh, it was October 19th, 1989, or 1998. Four military radar stations in Hundi Province, China, or the presence of an unidentified blimp hovering above a military flight training school. Once authorities determined the intruder was not a military or civilian uh, fl uh, flight, Colonel Lee, the base commander, ordered six jets to take off and intercept the UFO. At least 140 people on the ground saw the object. They observed it from the base. The UFO first appeared to be like a small star. Then it grew larger and larger, perhaps descending to lower altitude. They described it as an object as being a mushroom or a jellyfish-shaped object in the bottom with bright, dancing lights. And even uh, some of the eyewitnesses, 140 people, military and civilian, all reported this. A bunch of the witnesses even said it had tentacles hanging down, just like a jellyfish. It looked yeah. almost like a jellyfish in the sky. Uh, there's the Swedish jellyfish that are seen often in the mountains. 
They even have them. Uh, they're seen so often. They're in a lot of Scandinavian folklore. That's crazy. Uh, the re- right, the recent uh, God of War was it Ragnarok? Yeah, the one that just came out. They were in that. Yeah, they no were in way. There. Yeah, they were in there. Uh, the Hilden, the Hilden folk, or something like that. I don't. I haven't played that one. I played the first one, but not. But the- they had the giant atmospheric jellies <sighs> as a part of these giant peaceful creatures. They don't do anything. Yeah, but you can <sighs> release their babies. I didn't. Oh wow. Okay. So if, if it's in God of War, you know, it's real, it's real people. <laughs> so you got, there's, these are seen often, and these are often seen around mountain ranges. Hmm. So that's something I promised we talk about earlier is mountain ranges. Okay. So what is special about these guys seeing mountain ranges? So we have a lot of the mountain ranges around Appalachia, the Ozarks out there in Kansas, the Rockies in South America. They're seen all the time around these giant mountain ranges. And then, like, Sweden and China. Why are they in these mountain ranges, Jay? Well, I think I already know the answer. I don't want to spoil it. That's why I was asking you. Oh, okay. Well, um, I believe, if I'm correct, if I remember right. Oh, don't worry. I'll let you know. Uh, yeah, I know. Oh, trust me. I know you will. <laughs> it's the, uh, uh, all the nutrients from, like, our ground, like, our ground level. The wind currents will hit those mountains and it will push them up into the atmosphere. So it's just like an upswell of nutrients coming from down here being pushed up into our atmosphere. So it's a very high density food uh, source for uh, creatures up in our atmosphere. So like you were saying earlier with the, uh, the, the upswells of the krill in the ocean and then the big whales will come in, you know, and take advantage of that situation. Yes. That's just kind of the same thing happening here is that there's this, these, this nutrient uh, dense, uh, upswells of air are the krill in this situation, quote unquote. And then, so it's a nice food source for all these creatures to have something, you know, so they're going to be seen around where the food is. Yeah. And the other thing is it acts like a big elevator for them to get back up to the upper atmosphere. Oh, that's the other one. Yeah. That this could be this big up push of air. They would be the less energy to use to get back home. To get back up. Yeah. And I do think they're breeding on the ground and that they are, some of them are breeding on the ground or using the ground as a, a source. Uh, but yeah, I think that they're around these mountain ranges for food and for this the way to get home. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think they're power flyers, at least some of them. And then the other ones are around it because that's where the other organic UFOs are. Yeah. That's where the food is. Right, exactly. So you said it earlier and I ignored you on purpose. <laughs> oh, I'm just so used to it. Where are the bodies? What, what happened to the bodies? Yeah. Where are these? Meat showers, blood rains. We have a long history of them. Yes. Uh, I'm just going to use one example for this episode. Okay. But it's going to be the Kentucky Meat Shower. Probably the most famous one. Uh, definitely the most famous one. So the Kentucky Meat Shower was 1876. Mrs. Couch was uh, on her front porch and she reported p- giant pieces of meat falling from the sky. They could be as light as a snowflake up to the, like like golf ball or a little bigger sized. They fell from the sky 40 steps away from her house. So hundreds of people experienced this. People from all over the country came over and were trying to ID the meat. Everybody said, like a bunch of people said it was beef and then venison, mutton, right. bear, because it was super oily. Mm. And then a couple guys even said it may have been human. That's insane. Oh, gosh. But this had been analyzed, analyzed, analyzed by tons of uh, scientists and doctors of the day. Who are, the, who are those guys, though, that it may have been human? It, uh, yeah, those are the guys you look out for. Tastes just like people. Yeah. The oh, Dahmer party. Interesting. They just got off the Dahmer party. It, <laughs> yeah how, uh, how do you know wait it tastes like what now uh, people this tastes similar to people well I was a gold miner and, and uh, how do you Jeff know that out of food. Uh, uh, I read it in a book I read it in a book I read it in a book yeah this is what people taste like this was over three counties in Kentucky mm. uh, the Smithsonian still has a piece of the meat and uh, alcohol, it is. There's no testing you can do on it anymore. No, I bet you if you it. pulled it out, it would. Well, I mean, it would. It was the time of the day they didn't have formaldehyde. Like they available. ruined it. They ruined it. But three days later, or nine days later, more meat rained over the UK, and even some parts of what people said were vegetable like. Hmm. Interesting. And there's star jelly events all over, and that's another one is star jelly. Is a pretty famous aspect of this. And that's seen all over the world. All over the world. A lot of cultures have like that, even in like stories about uh, cosmic jelly, you know, star jelly, whatever you want to call it, falling from the sky. 
then there was uh we talked about recently on our show the uh the alien quote unquote spores billions of eggs fell over this town in Alaska with fatty droplets. This was uh, I'm trying to find the year 2010. They had them. They knew there were eggs. Well, one scientist said they were eggs of crustaceans. That's nuts. That's weird. And there's these big fatty globs, these big giant orange globs all over the river, lake, the lagoon, and all over the town. Mm-hmm. And it came in a rainstorm. So it was, a, it was atmospheric crabs. Duh. Atmospheric crabs. They were just dropping all their eggs. It's, it's like an ocean up there. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> you've, seen, you've seen those crab, uh, what is that, deadliest catch? You've seen those wave when they get the cameras on there, how many crabs are running along the bottom. It's insane. So if, that's obviously what happened. They're up there doing the same thing. They're so, crawling around the top of cr- clouds. So if an animal like this dies up in the upper atmosphere, uh, why is it coming down in chunks? Well, because terminal velocity would start shredding it. Terminal velocity affects animals differently. Uh, like if you drop an animal off an Empire State Building, it will survive the fall. It mm-hmm. doesn't have enough mass to its volume to affect it with, you know, dramatically. It's terminal velocity is much slower. Us, you know, we're not going to come apart, even if you, we jump out, you know, really high in the atmosphere. We're not going to come apart, but your skin starts flopping and all. Yeah. But we die when you hit the ground. Absolutely. <laughs> so if you're a lot bigger. Yeah. Even if you're mostly gas filled, you still have a lot of mass. Right. You're going to start shredding on the way down. Yeah. If you're that, you know, what's the word? Uh, I mean, just less dense than most other creatures. If As we speculate, yeah, you're going to get shredded when you fall through that. It's not like the atmosphere. It's not like falling through a, I don't know. It's not like falling in a vacuum. So right. No. So I think that's what's happening with these star jelly events, at least some of them. You think like, let's just use, for example, like one of the manta ray creatures, you know, that of the dies, giant jellies, it, giant jealous. Yeah. It dies and it's falling down through the atmosphere and it's you're hitting all that wind resistance stuff. And then it's just, it's just shredding, pulling it apart, shredding yeah. it. Yeah. And then Cause but, all these people ate these chunks of meat and they couldn't really tell what they <laughs> were eating. Oh, yeah, we did talk about this about a month ago on our show, I think, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, and I think I speculated. Yeah, we already figured that one out. It was just a a guy had captured a bunch of, he stole a bunch of turtles and got away on a hot air balloon. And then instead of uh, turning them over, he decided to just cut them up and, or, you know, part them out and throw them over the edge. Part them out and throw them (laughs) over the edge. He had every kind of meat in the Kentucky meat shower, and turtles have every kind of meat in them. Ham, chicken, roast beef. Shark. There's also the kind of <laughs> shark. There's also the carnivorous <laughs> cloud aspect. Ooh, yeah, like like the uh, like the cloud. What was that in Ireland? That um, the the so the pink fog of Ire the no the pink fog is in Florida. The Irish fog the the it was in the hills. I think it was in the Gray Hills. But they were told you just to lay down and let it pass over you. Right. Yeah, and and some like of the it, eyewitnesses said it was like a giant dog's tongue. I thought cat's tongue. Cat's tongue. Yeah, cat's tongue. Rough but wet. Yeah. Which cats do have like that weird, it's, it is, it's like sandpaper, but it's, it is, but it's not, I don't know, it's weird. It's weird. Much different than a dog. Much different than a dog. But if that was carnivorous. carnivorous, The carnivorous pink fog of Florida was a, you know, a really scary one to where a couple of the eyewitnesses said it was a very thick fog that had a pinkish tone, but would literally like a, almost like a block, the, a gelatinous cube out of D&D. There were squirrels and stuff would end up in it and it would just like eat all the meat. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, if, is this like one of those cloud-like creatures, you know, up, you maybe maybe not so far up in the atmosphere. They might be living in our section of the atmosphere. And you this know, is they could be camouflage. Yeah, camouflaging in with the clouds. Mm-hmm. Cuz I've seen some videos online and some I'm pretty sure are they seem legit. And We've played those on our live show. Yeah, the where they look like clouds that almost have fish scales in them. Yeah, like they're hiding. Like there's an animal hiding in there, and then they move, but they move like not like the other clouds around them. So it's it's obviously something's different going on than just clouds blowing by. So I have right here for you. I have, let's see, the raining boats, Carl Paris, Louisiana, eighteen. 18- 72. Mm. We've talked about this a long time ago. Yeah, I think, yeah, we got this from the Library of Congress. Yeah, it's actually in the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you the short name or the short story. But basically, uh, during a heavy, they had a heavy, heavy storm event. Like, almost the dams are blew out and everything. It was raining and this giant cloud came into town. And the pastor seen a whole bunch of people in this town seen it. And it kind of stopped raining when the cloud was over the town. This mm-hmm. giant black cloud. 
Cloud, not clown. That'd be scarier. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it starts raining <laughs> billions of bones. That's weird. all over this town. Yeah. And they started looking into it, and they were almost all gar scales and bones, gar fish bones. They're a fish. They have armor plates. They have like really tight scales, almost like arrowhead scales. Mm. So it starts raining, and then the cloud leaves, and it starts raining again after it threw up all these bones. Mm. And what we think happened is during a flooding event, Gar gets stranded all over. Like when you drive to Argos, Louisiana, you see them like dead in fields all the time because they just leave like during a rain event. It was one of these predators took a, and it, this food source that was available, ate a whole bunch of it, digest what it could, and then like an owl or, or even sometimes snakes yeah. threw up all the stuff it couldn't eat. Right, didn't eat it no more. So literally this town looked up and it just started pouring bones down on them. It's like stuff out of a, a, and then it a, left. a horror movie. Um, when I was in, no, I wasn't in high school. I used to coach high school uh, track and field. So, you know how, you know, those events, you know, they're all outside and whatnot. And it was super cold, but it was, it wasn't rainy, but it looked like it was, a, it was super cloudy and, you know, gray all evening and it looked like it was going to rain you know the whole time freezing cold winds blowing like crazy everyone's miserable and at one point and this was during a meet this gigantic black cloud and it was not black black but you know super super dark and it looked like a giant um ship like from independence day looked looked just like that just come hovering right over the entire stadium like fa- and everyone's seen it fast i mean looked like it was miles wide but it was rounded like it was a straight like line. Boom. Here it comes. And as it got right to the whole entire stadium, the whole entire event or arena got dead silent. And everyone just kind of looked up because we all thought we were either one just going to get massive downpour. We thought we were all just going to get drenched, you know, and we're watching this big cloud. It comes right over and it lasts for probably like and it's moving fast and it probably lasts for about like three minutes gigantic everything is dark and like it went from uh afternoon or like you know like four o'clock whatever five o'clock you know and late in the in the fall so you know it gets dark sooner but it's not dark at this time yet and it got like dark and it just hovered over everyone was silent and just stopped and watching this thing three minutes and it passes over and it's gone Never rained, never did nothing. And then everyone went back to like normal and stuff. But it was just eerie and very, very weird, like out of a movie. What was it? A cloud. It was just a big cloud. (laughs) No, it wasn't. Yeah. It was one of these things. I don't know. Maybe, but I don't know it. Like now that we're doing this, it's... Why haven't you never told me that before? I don't know. I thought maybe I did. I don't know. But what you what were you about to say? No, I just it's probably sizing up how many people in the stadium. Oh, sizing eat. up! Either you're gonna say size of a Walmart, and then this is bigger than a Walmart, <laughs> way, bigger. <laughs> way bigger. No, so hopefully we did some kind of job of convincing some people that there may be this chance that a small portion of UFOs or organic are creatures. Oh yeah, let's let's. We didn't even really dive into that too much, but that's basically the point we're trying to make with a lot of these UF. Not a lot with some UFO sightings. There is a window of chance that what you're seeing is organic creatures just doing their things, and you just happen to be lucky enough to get a glimpse of them. Because the human eye can only see so far, you know. That's unabated is about 10 miles. And anything above that, I don't, and and if it's translucent, you ain't going to see it unless you just get the right glimpse. Yeah, the right angles. Yeah. And then uh, we had one person say, then how come we see stars? Because they're pushing light to you. Hmm. They're pushing the light to you. Hmm. Maybe they're on to something, though. Maybe their stars ain't what we think they are. Well, even if they're outside the firmament or whatever you think, that they're still pushing light. They have to be because... Yeah, you're right. Either way. Because that's like, well, how come we can see stars? You're saying, I mean, I can't... No, you cannot see everything in the atmosphere. Like, you cannot. Right. Planes, those tiny, tiny planes, the jets you see, Mm -hmm. are still in your layer of the atmosphere. They're only like five to seven miles away, 99% of the time. Hmm. And you can barely If they didn't have the little lights at night, you wouldn't see them at all. Oh, at night you wouldn't see them. I'm talking about the jets like you see. Even during the day. Yeah, during the day you could, sometimes you look up and you just barely see those little dots. Well, if they didn't have those weird trails um, following them and darting across the sky, leaving a indicator where they're all at, you wouldn't see them at all. So what's your overall thoughts on this organic UFO thing? I mean, we know for a fact that there are 
uh, there is not R. There is life in our atmosphere. That's confirmed. So and we're uh, talking upper atmosphere. Upper atmosphere. Yes. 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 And that's a confirmation. We it's been recorded. Um, whatever scientific method you abide by or believe in, it doesn't. That was is a tangible result. You could put your finger on. That's true. So I mean. If we unless until we and there's there's so many stories throughout history, old newspapers, clippings, you know, and the Library of Congress. We did a lot of research on this, full of so many stories. The movie, and we didn't even touch on the movie. Uh, I don't like to touch on the movie. Okay, okay, we won't. Even, then we won't even go. No, there. the movie. Nope. Yeah. Everybody knows that the movie. Nope is basically this. We had our first two episodes out before the movie. Nope trailer even dropped. That's true. So we were on this before the movie even came out. And the crazy thing, what we found out about that movie is they had government assistance in writing the story and getting uh, ideas for how the creature should react uh, react, and just act in general on film. So, And we believe it might have been like an amalgamation of... Of several of the types. Yes, yeah, several different types of creatures up in our atmosphere and they turned it into one to you know, make up a scary movie. Soft disclosure is what I like to call that. Soft disclosure. Just feeding the baby birds out there, letting feeding them know. Feeding the baby birds. This is real. So once again, I've been the great and powerful mystery. And I've been J-Clone42. I want to take a second to say, you know, ch- if you want to check out our show, this is pretty much what it is every week. Yeah. Uh, Crips of the Corn Podcast. Find us everywhere. But you can find podcasts and all that fun stuff. And you can visit our website, Crips of the Corn Podcast.com. No, it's just Crips of the Corn dot com. Oh my the bad. The email is the email is Chris Chris Corn. Corn podcast at gmail.com. Yeah, I'm we're professionals. We're professional podcasters. But no, we can take a minute and just thank Tony for thinking of us for this special thing. Yeah. Uh, thank you do. very much. Um we love Tony. Absolutely. And I hope he has a very happy holidays and I hope everyone out there has happy holidays and a very Merry Christmas. Very Merry, Merry Christmas. Hopefully in this after Thanksgiving, but hopefully you enjoy Thanksgiving and everybody is safe and everything. But now what do we got to say? The truth will set you free. But first, it'll piss you off. Bye. Bye. Push me down.